there we go. Uh, so I'm going to discuss targeted therapies for the advanced thyroid cancers. Um, and um, a, a lot of this talk has to do with the, you know, molecular testing uh, talks that we had previously. So basically, how do we translate that into uh, therapies for patients? Um, these are my conflicts. Okay, so again, just showing origins of thyroid cancer and that um, when you go from, um, you have these distinct mutations in papillary follicular um, and herthal cell, and then as these become less differentiated, the, the driver mutation is retained in poorly differentiated and anaplastic, but they gather new mutations. Um, and then the important, we didn't talk a whole lot about medullary, um, but the, the, the more common mutations in medullary thyroid cancer are RET and RAS. So before 2013, for, for differentiated thyroid cancer, we had um, very few options. We would um, remove the tumors, suppress the TSH, and give radioiodine. And if that didn't you know, if the patient continued to progress, give more radioiodine, but really, you know, there wasn't much else except to refer patients to, to clinical trials. And so um, we needed therapies for patients that had become radioiodine refractory. And so that was then, this is now. This is now what we have for patients who no longer respond to radioiodine. And for, of course, medullary thyroid cancers where we don't give radioiodine. Uh, so we have um, in green the antiangiogenic drugs, sorafenib, lenvatinib for differentiated thyroid cancer, vandetinib, cabozantinib for medullary thyroid cancer. Cabo now has another indication in thyroid for second-line therapy in differentiated thyroid cancer. The drugs in blue are more targeted, um, molecularly targeted therapies. So um, BRAF MEK inhibitors for BRAF mutated ATC, the, this is approved. Um, larotrectinib and entrectinib are NTREC inhibitors, so for NTREC fusion thyroid cancers, and selpercatinib, pralcetinib are the RET inhibitors for RET mutations and for RET fusion. So the mutations that we see in medullary and the RET fusions are seen in the follicular-derived thyroid cancers, so um, mostly your papillaries and then in some of your uh, poorly diff and ATC patients. And uh, basically, multi-kinase inhibitors um, have been uh, in use for many, many years now um, in thyroid. And we had, um, you know, starting with serafinib and lenvatinib, you know, serafinib um, had some nice responses, progression-free survival, definitely better than placebo. Um, then came lenvatinib, which, you know, was much more potent, is much more potent than serafinib. And you see a much wider spread here on the progression-free survival curves, um, which basically reflects the potency of this drug. So um, similar story for vandetinib, cabozantinib for medullary thyroid cancer, antiangiogenic drugs um, that also have some RET inhibition, um, but they're not selective RET inhibitors. And so you see um, an improvement in progression-free survival with both um, the vandetinib compared to placebo and the cabo compared to placebo. These were slightly different trials. Vandetinib didn't require progression um, and, and cabozantinib did. And, and there are other differences, but basically the multi-kinase inhibitors um, improve progression-free survival in DTC and MTC. However, there are relative contraindications for antiangiogenics, so we can't use them in all patients, patients that have poor cardiac function or recent myocardial infarctions. Um, Non-uncontrolled hypertension because the drugs cause hypertension. Large unhealed wounds, they will not heal on these drugs. Uh, history of colitis, diverticulitis, intestinal perforation, recent bowel surgery. We have seen patients bleed um, from being on these drugs, um, especially if they have a history of these. So we need to be very careful and, and also ask about it. Tumors invading the trachea, esophagus, and great vessels because these patients are more prone to bleed. And particularly, we've had problems with patients with tracheostomies, so we're pretty careful with those. Um, uh, hemoptysis or use of anticoagulants because these um, can cause bleeding again. And then very low body weight um, is, you know, not, a, it, it's a relative contraindication, but 
with all of the kinase inhibitors except for vandetinib, patients do lose a lot of weight. Um, and so if you already have a patient who's quite thin, um, it's very easy to get to a point where you have to hold the drug for, for weight loss. So the bottom line is antiangiogenics are not for everybody. And so we need to, um, we need to have other, other treatments for these patients. And RET is um, uh, you know, a, a great target. It's um, uh, seen both in medullary and in, uh, in, in our, our follicular derived thyroid cancers as fusions. And so uh, we, we do look for these in, in those patients. Um, and, you know, Dr. Nikiforov spoke about, um, about fusions and how, you know, there may be some um, indications on the pathology that suggests that your patient has a fusion. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, th that's going to be very interesting to, to um, hear a little bit more about that as we get more data. There are two selective RET inhibitors, pralcetinib and selpercatinib. Selpercatinib was the first one that was approved, so I'm going to talk about it first not because I think it's better, um, but uh, just because it was the first out, out of the, um, uh, out as, as, an, as an FDA approved drug. And these are the data for RET mutation, MTC. The, the waterfall plot on your left is, these are patients that had been previously treated with vandetinib or cabozantinib or both. And so you see even previously treated patients have these phenomenal responses. Um, RET mutant MTC that was treatment naive, also, you know, phenomenal responses, even higher, a little bit higher, 73% versus 69% in the previously treated. And RET fusion, um, you know, not a lot of patients, but that's just because RET fusions are rare. Um, they're hard to find. We see them a lot in young patients um, who oftentimes don't need any treatment. And so they, they are um, rare patients. So, um, this is the data that we have for RET fusion thyroid cancer, 71% response rate. You see that this included papillary and anaplastic and poorly differentiated. I don't believe that this is truly a Herthel cell. <clears throat> this is probably an oncocytic papillary, but, um, but it was, we weren't able to um, get the slides on this um, pathology to verify what exactly this was um, because we don't really see RET fusions in Herthel cell. But really good response rate, 71%. Um, you know, I, these patients actually even respond, in my opinion, they respond even longer than the medullary thyroid cancer patients. So whenever we have the opportunity to put a patient with a RET fusion on a selective RET inhibitor, we do. Um, pralcetinib was the second drug approved uh, not long after. This was, these were smaller trials, had fewer patients. But basically, very similar response rates. TKI um, uh, exposed patients, previously treated as patients, 60% response rate, 71% in TKI naive MTC. And you know, here we had only uh, differentiated thyroid cancers. There were no um, anaplastic thyroid cancers, and um, we don't we don't think there were poorly differentiated thyroid cancers, but you know these, the pathology is always sometimes difficult because they don't um, review them centrally. But 89% uh, in RET fusion thyroid cancer. So both drugs are excellent for both RET um, mutation and RET fusion thyroid cancers. Uh, the um, the NTRAC inhibitors are also very interesting, and I'm only going to discuss larotrectinib because it's the it's the drug where we have information specifically on thyroid cancer um, because these studies were all done as basket trials. So that was for any patient that had an NTRAC fusion, um, any you know solid tumor with NTRAC fusion. And so there, are, you know, there are little date. There wasn't a lot of uh, information on the thyroid cancer patients in those pre in those first publications. So this is a paper that um, I think was just um, accepted for publication. Um, or, or we're close, but this is uh, from the uh, last ATA meeting, uh, looking at larotrectinib in thyroid cancer patients. And you see, again, with the, the blue or the papillary thyroid cancer patients, so uh, uh, phenomenal responses in NTRAC fusion papillary. Um, we had a response rate of 86%. And, um, but 
it gets a little murkier with anaplastic and poorly differentiated. So again, these were not able to be reviewed centrally. And so there was a, you know, some doubt about which ones were actually ATC versus poorly diff. Um, but you see that in anaplastic thyroid cancer patients, the response rate really drops down to 29%. And if you look at the, um, the progression-free survival, it's also vastly different from differentiated thyroid cancers versus ATC. And so, you know, this is a really interesting, this, this graph to me is very interesting because if you look at the BRAF data, it's actually, BRAF inhibitor data, it's actually the opposite, right? So we see fewer responses in DTC, but, um, but phenomenal responses in ATC. And so, um, so, you know, and hopefully at some point we'll, we'll understand this better. So moving on to the BRAF inhibitors, dibrafen and trametinib for ATC, patient has to have a BRAF V600E mutation, not for fusions. Um, this is for this particular mutation. The original study showed 69% response rate, um, and they didn't, hadn't met the median overall survival, but, you know, this was really a home run, and this was approved based on this very small study. Um, since then, the data have been updated, and so this just came out, um, uh, I thought it was this year, but maybe it was last year. Um, this is the updated data from the ROAR study. That was the basket trial for, eight, for um, BRAF mutated tumors. ATC was one of the baskets. So they now have met a median overall survival, which came out to be 14.5 months. And this is really kind of consistent with what we see in clinical practice that after the first year, we start really losing a lot of patients. Um, and so, so th this really kind of clarified what the actual median overall survival was for these patients. Um, I, I wanna point out that, you know, these responses are absolutely phenomenal when you, when you get them and, and you get them quite a bit, thankfully. Um, this is a patient of ours who was transferred into MD Anderson with this trach, and you see her tumors coming out of her neck, and that's four weeks later. Um, skin is completely healed. This is not an atypical response. So they, it happens very fast. So we can really, you know, um, spare patients of tracheostomies if we're able to move fast and get the BRAF um, by IHC, you know, um, and be able to get them on BRAF inhibitors. Well, what about in DTC? BRAF inhibitors and DTC have been studied extensively. Um, we, um, we did this study many, many years ago. It was published in 2016 on the, on the left, which is the vemurafenib study. Um, and then we've uh, also completed the dibrafenib uh, versus dibrafenib plus trametinib study. Uh, and this is just a table that I put together kind of looking at the um, response rates, but it's on the order of about 30%, essentially, 30 to 45 20, for previously treated, it's 27%. For treatment naive, 39% with vemurafenib, and then a little higher with dibrafenib, and then dibrafenib plus, plus trametinib. But you don't see those really high response rates that you see in ATC. Okay, so no talk is complete without speaking about immunotherapy. So uh, I showed some of this this morning with the data with spartalizumab. It's the only study that we have with single agent immunotherapy in ATC. Phenomenal study, it was 42 patients worldwide enrollment and the response rate was 19%. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but actually for immunotherapy, this is a fairly good number. Um, and so, um, so we, there are patients who, who respond very nicely to immunotherapy, but a lot of them don't. And the challenge will be trying to figure out who are the ones that respond. So they did some of this work and we see that the pdl one expressing patients are the ones that live longer and they also um, have better responses. So, uh, so we do uh, look at pdl one and ATC. Um, that's pretty controversial at the moment because there's not a lot of data to support it, but we are using the information at MD Anderson. Um, we did this, uh, we published this study now many years ago, uh, and uh, essentially we started to see this drop off of patients who were not responding anymore to targeted therapy, right? Because it was back in the day when we used single agent or we used dibrafentrametinib in our patients um, off trial. Um, 
And once they stopped responding, we would add in a third drug, which was pembrolizumab. Um, in almost all of these, it was pembro. I think we had one Nevo patient. And we would then see responses again. So we had a 42% response rate, very small number of patients, but it was just to show that, you know, um, that that whatever that these first of all these patients progress through targeted therapy and that you could salvage some of them with immunotherapy by adding it on not subtracting and adding uh, we would basically leave them on their targeted therapy and add the immunotherapy and and we did that because initially we stop we would stop the targeted therapies and then patients would die very quickly the immunotherapy just doesn't work fast enough and so we started to just keep the um, targeted therapies there Combinations, I, I touched upon this this morning, but I actually want to show you some data. So this is our atezolizumab study that um, I've, I've presented at ASCO before, and hopefully I'll publish this year. But we essentially said, okay, we're going to treat patients differently by their mutation status because we know that BRAF inhibitors work for BRAF mutations. This was before the approval of dabrafen or trametinib, but we already knew this because we participated in that trial. So we... Um, we're, we participated in this Genentech Alliance where we um, basically stratified patients by mutation and then gave them a treatment, a targeted therapy, plus the immunotherapy um, based on their mutation. So BRAF got the triplet, uh, RAS and NF1 got a doublet of, of Kobe Atezo, and then these two cohorts didn't work out so well, so I'm not going to really uh, spend time on that. But this was, uh, we basically enrolled 51 patients and, you know, pretty standard baseline characteristics. Um, and these were our, our results. So the primary endpoint was based on targeted therapy with immunotherapy. And our median overall survival in these patients was 18 months. And that's largely driven by the BRAF cohort, right? So, um, so you know, you might look at this and say, well, you know, big deal. Um, the BRAF, we know it works. Um, but, you know, even these patients who had RAS and NF1, and the RAS patients do miserably, as I've already pointed out this morning, um, still had a median overall survival. It was fairly good, almost nine months. Um, but what I, you know, I, when I presented this at ASCO, we didn't have the Debraf intermittent phase two updated data. And so there was, you know, a lot of kind of, well, what does it mean? Um, you know, we know BRAF inhibitors work. Why, why add a third drug and make it more toxic? And I, I, you know, I think when you look at the 24-month overall survival, you see um, that is vastly different. 20, the 24-month uh, overall survival was 72% in, in the ATEZO trial with the triplet versus 31% um, with the doublet in the, in the phase two basket trial. So I do think that um, immunotherapy is the way to go. Um, and, and hopefully in our next guidelines, we will be um, able to, to really um, say that more forcefully. Okay, so I call this part of the talk, and I only have 10 minutes, uh, returning to our roots. And some of you will recognize these two um, gentlemen. Basically, you know, we kind of went crazy for a long time with kinase inhibitors and then came to the realization that that's not the end of the story because all patients end up progressing on kinase inhibitors. So what do you do? And our strategy is basically to return to our roots. We use radioiodine, we use surgery. So it's kind of a multimodal approach with kinase inhibitors and still, you know, using um, the things that we know that work, like surgery and radioiodine. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the ATC patients, essentially what that means is that um, if a patient has a BRAF mutation, we put them on very quickly on a BRAF MEK inhibitor, and then um, we watch to see if they have tumor shrinkage and become resectable. Almost none of these patients are resectable baseline, as many of you know. And so we basically showed here in this very small cohort of patients that there, you know, there may be something there. Um, we hope to be able to show more data, um, you know, longer follow-up of these patients. Um, but at the moment, what we had was a 12-month overall survival of 80, 12-month survival of 83%. Um, and again, this is just to highlight why we why we operate because we we get that question a lot. Um, why not just leave them on a kinase inhibitor? You know, 
are you going to subject them to a surgery? And the reason is that they all progress. And this is a patient of ours who had a scalp metastasis, very nice response to BRF MEK inhibitor, and then it starts to come back. And um, at that point, we removed her thyroid because at the time we weren't really doing that, but we removed this scalp metastasis. It was her only site of metastasis and we removed her thyroid gland. And lo and behold, in this scalp metastasis, this patient now continues to have the BRAF mutation, but now also has a KRAS mutation. So these patients develop these new mutations and, um, and become resistant to the targeted therapy. Um, I'm not sure if I have enough time to talk a, a lot about this, but we did publish some data on, uh, on neoadjuvant approach, some updated data, and uh, looked at our patients you know, before we did surgeries on these BRAF mutated patients. Um, so we had 43 of those, and then we had 20 that had been operated on after BRAF inhibitor. And, um, you know, small number of patients, of course, um, but with a fairly good long median follow-up of, of over a year, um, the surgery patients had not met the median overall survival. No surgery patients was 0.8 years. And so we now have an ongoing new adjuvant trial. Um, it, it's, we have it at MD Anderson, but we are expanding or have maybe open some sites other places. I'm not sure what the status of that. But what's great is that this is now in the ATA guidelines for ATC. So um, we do hope to, to continue updating this data and have some, some, pro some prospective data for you. Okay, um, and so basically we kind of turned the algorithm on its head. We used to have this cookbook for 4B patients. What did you do? You said, well, did they, are they operable? If your surgeon said yes, you took them to surgery, gave them chemo rads. If the surgeon said no, you just went straight to chemo rads. And then 70% of these patients would progress within the year. So not great outcomes. Um, and so we um, developed this, you know, this team that was uh, basically just treating, uh, we, we would um, have lots of, you know, available slots for ATC patients. We would give them targeted therapy. If they're operable, they go to surgery, then get chemo rads. If not, they stay on their targeted therapy. Um, and if, um, if, if they progress, then they can still go to, to, to radiation. Uh, we're also doing this with RET inhibitors. So um, this is Mark Zafiri, who's our head and neck surgeon, who's leading these neoadjuvant studies. And this is an example of one of our patients who had MTC um, and we, you know, his tumor shrunk with cell percatinib. I, I need to probably update this. It still has the letter number. Um, and now we're doing a prospective study with cell percatinib for RET fusion or RET mutated thyroid cancer. Okay, redifferentiation. I'm not going to go into a lot of this because the next talk is about this. Um, and so Dr. Fagan will tell you all about it, but basically redifferentiation is ability to restore, um, uh, the ability to restoring the ability to concentrate radioiodine. And we do this with targeted therapies. So BRAF inhibitors for BRAF mutated, um, for, for the RAS mutated patients, or they don't have a BRAF mutation, we generally use MEK inhibitors. Um, and then we're now also starting to see some um, cases coming out of NTREC fusion and RET fusion patients who are, um, who are on selective inhibitors who, who have successfully redifferentiated. And what the advantage of this is that you're able to then stop the kinase inhibitor if the patient um, redifferentiates. And you can just see that you can stop the, the chemo and see what happens. This is beneficial to our patients because you know, the, these, all these drugs have toxicities. And so it's really um, important to the patient that um, they at least be able to get a break from, from, rate, from uh, chemotherapy. So um, I will end with just uh, telling you there are many options now for thyroid cancer, particularly MTC and PTC. Um, I didn't uh, have a lot of time to talk about the, the, the um, toxicities with some of these more targeted agents but they in general, in general are less toxic than the antiangiogenic drugs. So that's a, a big win for us um, and for patients. Uh, but, and we can, you know, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. We've seen lots of advances, advances in ATC, and ATC patients. Uh, we, we now have really good therapies for BRAF mutated, um, you know, the rare patient where you find a fusion, that's more controversial. And then, of course, the patients that don't have any of that, those are more complicated patients that should go to clinical trials. 
Um, I think neoadjuvant um, and redifferentiation are really kind of the wave of the future. Neoadjuvant has already been included in the ATA, um, uh, ATC guidelines. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully when we complete our trials, um, you know, in, in, with the, um, with the RET inhibitor um, neoadjuvant trial, um, at some point, maybe that will be also included. Um, the clinical trials for redifferentiation, um, there have been several that are published. Um, there are more coming down the, the pike. And of course, clinical trials for redifferentiation that, um, and, and I, you know, these are very difficult trials to do and they have to be designed in a very particular way. And I think Dr. Fagan is going to really enlighten us on, on what, how best to do these uh, studies. And, um, and, and hopefully that will at some point be addressed in guidelines. So with that, I thank you. And um, uh, this is our MD Anderson family. This is our last photo in 2018. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't take one in 2019. And then after that, we haven't really seen each other. So, um, but, but this is most of the gang for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>